uh, John O'Connor. Thank you, um, Lucia, um, and, and thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here with my esteemed colleagues and with all of you in the room, both online and uh, in the natural world. Um, just a note before I begin, in keeping with the detail um, of this talk, um, and I use two different systems to generate images. You'll see them identified as we proceed through the, the, the talk. Um, and also at a very early draft stage of the text, I ran it through ChatGPT and asked to style it as a TED talk. So here are the results. I'm afraid, Lucia, when I timed this, it was for um, going to 20 minutes. So I will try and speak fast so that we don't overextend the time. So can I just check that everybody can see um, the slides? Great. Yes, all good. Thank you. Um, I want to start by asking you to envision a future where the convergence of technology and human consciousness transforms the very fabric of our society. As we stand on the precipice of the 21st century, I hear the echo of Marshall McLuhan's profound insights. In the medium is the massage, first published in 1967. He said, we need to be conscious of what is happening around us rather than allowing ourselves to be distracted by the constant background noise and clutter of continuous chatter that makes up our contemporary world. Our focus should be on the technology that is driving development. He urged us to scrutinize the emergence of new and highly sophisticated tools, warning that we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. What he foresaw at the beginning of what he called the electric age has now materialized in the digital era, a realm where our tools not only shape us, but define the very essence of our humanity. This digital era is characterized by the relentless march of technological progress. We find ourselves grappling with the unforeseen consequences of our past creations. The internet, the World Wide Web, permanently connected phones, consumer-oriented vi virtual worlds, and VR headset devices, along with the advent of generative artificial intelligence, have become the building blocks of our digital existence. As with any technological revolution, the pace is being set by entrepreneurs and profit-driven corporations, often at the expense of broader societal considerations. Ethical and social responsibilities take a backseat to the pursuit of innovation and financial gain. John Carmack, former chief technology officer of Oculus, interviewed in 2020, complained about a lack of willingness in people to accept the stark economics of resource allocation. He said, you have to make decisions about where things go. Economically, you can deliver a lot more value to a lot of people in the virtual sense. That an influential developer would suggest VR ought to be considered a solution to dwindling resources in the natural world should set the warning bells ringing extremely loudly. Gabe Newell, the head of gaming company Valve Corporation, was even more explicit when he extolled the virtues of brain-computer interfaces during an interview in New Zealand. He referred to the near future reality of being able to write signals to people's minds, to change how they're feeling or deliver better than real visuals in games. He went on to suggest that brain-computer interfaces will lead to gaming experiences far better than a player could get through their meat peripherals, as in their eyes and ears. If that isn't enough to cause concern, he adds that it will soon be possible to edit feelings digitally, saying the benefit could be the reduction or total removal of unwanted feelings or conditions from the brain for therapeutic reasons. He reveals that his company is contributing to projects developing synthetic body parts 
in exchange for access to leaders in the neuroscience field who teach us a lot. This is a long way from producing games, and it points to the ambitions of a wealthy elite that acknowledge the global crisis, but envisages very different solutions for the rich than for the poor. David Chalmers, professor of philosophy and neural science at New York University, has a more benign view of technology. Last year, he suggested that VR is real, writing that virtual worlds are not illusions or fictions, or at least they need not be. What happens in VR really happens. The objects we interact with in VR are real. Furthermore, he added that life in virtual worlds can be as good, in principle, as life outside virtual worlds. You can lead a fully meaningful life in a virtual world. However, it would seem that a recent wake-up call has emerged from the AI community itself, urging us to recognize the existential threat posed by artificial intelligence. Their call to action is clear. Mitigating the risks of AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. In response to the recent AI, in response, the recent AI safety summit hosted by the UK brought together politicians, diplomats, developers, and entrepreneurs. Notably, notably absent though, were the independent critical voices, those perhaps more likely to be objective. Academics, for instance, those who study ethics, philosophers, sociologists, or experts in, <laughs> in the history and, of science and technology do not appear to have been consulted, thus leaving potentially critical perspectives untapped. The conversation, dominated by figures like Elon Musk and British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, showcased the influence of industry leaders on global issues. Musk's reputation as a solipsistic yet prominent influencer on global issues has already been in evidence during his highly visible campaign to purchase Twitter and the subsequent dismantling of the platform to enable him rebuild it closer to his vision for the world. Or perhaps, considering his ownership of SpaceX, we should say his vision for the solar system. Not to mention his egotistical belief that he alone can lead humanity to a greater destiny. You probably have already noticed the anomaly in this image, although Midjourney was asked to generate an image showing Musk being interviewed by Sunak. Neither person is Sunak. Both are Musk. This curious decision was made solely by the chatbot. Noting that the sensational doomsday scenario of AI leading to human extinction comes from the sector itself demands a certain skepticism. The philosopher and founder of the University of Berkeley Center, Center for New Media, David Bates, challenges the notion that AI is on the cusp of developing consciousness or self-awareness, as some have claimed. He questions the validity of predictions suggesting imminent singularity, that future point in time where technological advancement becomes irreversible and surpasses human intelligence. He prompts us to scrutinize whether AI, which is nurtured on flawed and questionably biased human inputs, merely perpetuates existing knowledge and offering scant comfort stifles the emergence of the truly new. Noel Fitzpatrick, professor of philosophy and founder of the European Culture and Technology Lab at the European University of Technology, argues that artificial intelligence as a form of artificial stupidity is the lack of abstraction, lack of the ability to think, overwhelmed by the sheer vastness of the data and the size of the task. He articulates a concern that is at the root of this technology 
and that is the assumption and widespread belief that everything can be measured, and by extension, that everything of importance is measurable, that all problems can be solved through the development of bigger data sets and more powerful computational modeling. A team at Ohio State University examined whether large language models, known as LLMs, of the type that drive generative AI, grasp the essence of the reasoning required to solve a problem. They tested the ability of an LLM to not only achieve a correct answer on its own, but also to be able to hold and defend its belief instead of blindly getting misled by the user's invalid arguments and critiques, and found that across a range of complex reasoning benchmarks spanning math, common sense, logic, and big bench tasks, and despite their impressive performance on generating correct step-by-step solutions in the beginning, LLMs such as ChatGPT cannot maintain their beliefs in truth for a significant portion of examples when challenged by oftentimes absurdly invalid arguments. Amidst this debate, one certainty emerges, the omnipresence of AI and VR in our future. This fact demands a paradigm shift in our approach to education. In a world with access to unimaginable quantities of raw data, Alongside the continuing exponential growth of digital processing capabilities, it becomes imperative that we equip the citizens of tomorrow with skills that transcend the mere acquisition of data and information. They must become proficient in the generation of knowledge. In this context, knowledge is created when information is integrated into our minds in a way that we are able to adapt it to different circumstances and apply it to analyzing and solving problems. As digital environments continue to evolve, students need to learn, (coughs) excuse me, students need to learn not only how to navigate these realms, but also cultivate distinctly human attributes, discrimination, spontaneity, and creativity. Attributes that distinguish human intelligence from artificial intelligence. My response to this challenge was to develop a course that would allow students to explore this technology and experience it for themselves. Utilizing the widely available and easily accessible platform Second Life, developed in San Francisco by Linden Lab, students are immersed in a collaborative online environment that transcends physical boundaries and affords the opportunity to navigate the virtual, developing the necessary skills to thrive much as previous generations required a different set of skills to live in the natural world. The specific nature of human intervention in virtual environments bears particular consideration. We manifest as a digital persona, commonly referred to as an avatar. This term is not accidental. It was first introduced in the digital game space in the 1980s by Richard Garriott, developer of the game Ultima 4 Quest of the Avatar. He explained that he wanted the player to respond to what are called moral dilemmas and ethical challenges as they personally would respond. He said that the character you are creating in the game, I wanted to be you, not your alter ego. He intentionally appropriated the ancient Sanskrit term that describes the manifestation in the physical world of a deity from the spiritual realm, realizing it was a perfect fit for the game. The term is now commonly used to describe our digital manifestations in many online virtual applications. Garriott may have unwittingly bequeathed us an important approach for interacting with technology. The inherent power vested in the term is a reminder that our tools, no matter how complex or sophisticated, are our own conceptions. 
Fitzpatrick reminds us of the origin, the origin of the world technology is in the ancient Greek techne, meaning a system or a method of making or doing, an art or a craft, a technique or a practice. This supports the broader understanding of technology, not just as a tool, but more importantly, as a form of becoming human. Through techne, all forms of techniques and practices, we become who we are, both as individuals and as a society. An avatar permits embodiment and facilitates intervention in VR environments, thereby affording the opportunity not only to explore the virtual, but also to consider what it truly means to be human, whether inhabiting the natural world or virtual environments. Conscious self-awareness and careful observation are becoming increasingly important in the digital space. For example, the phenomenon of AI hallucination merits some scrutiny. Chosen recently as the Cambridge Dictionary Word of the Year, it is defined as the output from a generative chatbot or image generator that is untrue, but appears plausible due to the confident eloquence of the format. It happens because the LLMs that power generative AI work on probability rather than understanding. In other words, they cannot attach meaning to words in the way that we do. They merely process massive amounts of data very rapidly to predict an apparently rational output. They give only an impression of understanding. The difficulty I see is that by calling it a hallucination, when the AI is simply making an error, increases the illusion that the algorithm is actually thinking, is aware, is perhaps even sentient, when clearly this is not the case. Revisiting the previously mentioned stupidity of AI, its propensity to believe spurious argument, it then becomes clear that this technology should be approached with great care. Similarly, online game designers and manufacturers are now writing algorithms to generate deliberate glitch-like effects as a way of improving gameplay by concealing latency. These algorithms are triggered automatically when a loss of synchronicity between players occurs. They generate probable player moves and reactions so the rhythm of the game is not disrupted. It is an elegant solution, but as with the AI hallucination, it is untrue in the sense that the avatar is no longer under the player's control. It is beholden to an algorithm, one of which the player is not even aware. It may well be that AI hallucinations and its lack of confidence in its own abilities along with algorithmic glitches, appear harmless at present. Yet, as AI becomes more sophisticated, it is not unreasonable to anticipate a time when errors will be extremely difficult to detect, leading to an inability to discriminate between truth and untruth, the real and the virtual, us and algorithm. I suggest that in this situation, the use of an avatar affords the opportunity for reflection, the time and space to discriminate, and the potential to avoid being misled. As we ponder the implications of virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and generative tools, the question looms, are we unwittingly constructing echo chambers that cater to our comfort? Bates challenges us further questioning whether our reliance on prediction eliminates the potential for genuine novelty, forcing us to recreate the future based on past experiences. In the face of this technological juggernaut, society needs individuals who can discern and create amidst the rapid evolution of our tools. My responsibility as an educator is clear, to guide students not just in mastering this technology, but in preserving the awareness of their humanity while engaging with the most powerful and potentially perilous tools we have unleashed yet.
Our technological triumphs cannot hide the sobering truth. Our home planet is in peril. Our relentless pursuit of progress has pushed our environmental interventions to the brink, surpassing sustainable limits. Humanity, in its pursuit of advancement, is depleting Earth's resources at an alarming pace, creating an unsustainable trajectory, much like a serpent consuming its own tail. Ron Garan, a seasoned NASA astronaut, whose extraordinary journey took him 71 million miles, almost 3,000 orbits, over 178 days in space, reflected from this celestial vantage point. His perspective underwent a profound transformation. The Earth, observed from on high, revealed itself as remarkably fragile, challenging his preconceived notions. Garin's revelation aligns with a phenomenon known as the overview effect, a cognitive shift experienced by our astronauts when witnessing Earth suspended in the cosmic vastness. This transformative experience underscores the intricate interconnections and interdependencies that define all life on our planet, transcending national borders, economic disparities, and, e and ideological divides. The pivotal moment that encapsulates the overview effect unfolded in 1968 during the Apollo 8 mission. The iconic Earthrise photograph capturing our home emerging from behind the moon in vibrant colour provided a shared opportunity for humanity to partake in this cosmic revelation. Earthrise, a collective experience that transcends time and space, has afforded us all a glimpse into the fragility and interconnectedness of our shared existence. As we stand at the nexus of technological prowess and environmental stewardship, the choices we make today reverberate across the tapestry of time. Earthrise calls upon us to recognize our responsibility as custodians of this delicate oasis in the cosmos. The overview effect, once exclusive to astronauts, has become a shared narrative, urging us to, in, to unite in our commitment to a sustainable future. In this dance between progress and preservation, Earthrise beckons us to shape a destiny that honours the delicate balance of our interconnected world for generations to come. And so the challenge is not to be mere passive observers, but active architects of a future where the harmonious integration of technology and humanity fosters progress without sacrificing our essence. Thank you, John. Um, I think I will start with the question. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. But if in the audience someone wants to ask a question, please raise your hand. So from your discussion, I have a lot of notes, um, but I will ask to a point why you use the word educator. Like when we look into the literature and we start identifying terms regarding the role of the, the teacher, the coach, the mentor. So it, it caught my attention that you went for the word educator um, because this has been subject to quite a lot of discussion within Ilara team, um, kind of the work that we do and, and are we teachers or should we call ourselves something different and educator emerge uh, as part of our discussion. So I'm, I'm quite curious on, on why you refer to yourself as an educator. Yeah. It it was a deliberate choice. Um, it's broader than a teacher. A teacher implies for me um, the old uh, sage on the stage idea of somebody who knows everything telling other people what it's about. An educator is more somebody who's drawing out that internal and inherent um, ability and understanding that people have. So I, I just, I've always felt it's a, it's a broader term to describe a more engaged practice where it also implies that we are all students. Educators are also students. And once you stop being a student yourself, as far as I'm concerned, you really, you fail then as being a good teacher. 
Thank you. I have a question in the chat where you say your AI image slides were captioned as image by DALI 2. Are you evocating attributing imagination to those AI platforms? That's from uh, Sidearm Madonna. Very good, Sidearm. I'm well picked up. I was quite conscious of that, actually, when I was writing the captions, uh, and I deliberately used the word imagined. And I, but I fell into the same trap that the tech technicians who call um, AI errors hallucinations um, made. Uh, so I, I, yeah, well, sp well spotted. <laughs> I have, I have to hold my hands up and say I also fell. <laughs> So um, if there are questions... I, sorry, the answer, I'm, I'm, so I'm not attributing imagination to the AI platforms. No. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if we have questions on the floor, please there let is, me know. You see, there was another question earlier um, from Elena. Okay. Uh, she said she's two questions. Do you think that in the future the teachers' jobs will be taken over by robots? And if yes, how would that look? And my answer to that is no. Um, I don't think they will, and I certainly hope they won't. Um, so we don't have to worry about how it would look. Um, my point really is that um, we're working with closed systems, so they can't really inspire or, or help people to create uh, or become human beings. And, and, if, and if you think of education as really a a helping of people to become the best human being and the best person and the best contributor to society that they can be, uh, that can't really be done by any kind of machine, is my proposition. That's something that only human beings can do. So the next one um, from your discussion is when you talk about the paradigm shift in education. So I... I Kind of fully agree with that um, and also the you presented from your talk and correct me if i'm wrong the holistic approach toward education and what we have seen over the years is like commodification of education you mentioned the financial gains you mentioned uh again market driven education is nowadays market driven and technology innovation is coming from the industry 5.0 now pressures that we're going to be facing so how do you see that paradigm shift taking? Because personally, what I see is a more kind of aggressive take from the economy towards what we are doing in the classroom and giving that push towards keep market driven, keep market center, and make sure that you deliver kind of automats that can work and function in this economic context. Yes, um, I agree with you. Um, the paradigm shift I see it's a it's a complete paradigm shift. So there wouldn't be there isn't going to be time to go into it in any detail here. But I think first of all, we're we're now living in a new kind of society where data is pretty much freely available on everything and anything. So the old approach to education, where experts needed to learn lots of stuff because it wasn't freely available, has, is changing. That doesn't mean that people don't need to be experts because we, as we've seen, we can't rely on machines to give us the right answers. So you do still have to be an expert in able to, to enable you to work with these AI devices and so on. And I don't see that ever changing, that, that you would always need the human discrimination uh, to, to do the final piece of work. And that does mean developing an expertise. But how that's done, and, and that shift in how, what people need to learn and how they need to go about learning it and how they need to really work on, on that ability to be creative and discriminative, discriminatory and to see where you need to bring those, those um, abilities to bear is, for me, the, the paradigm shift. Um, this all being done in a, in a global context, which is like we are today in a hybrid situation, adds to the confusion and the difficulty because very often we're not going to be dealing with uh, people in the natural world in a face-to-face -face basis. And sometimes we may not even know if we're dealing with people because the development of, of uh, very realistic robots, um, I, I think there are intelligent systems that can pass the Turing test, which for a long time was the distinction between whether we accept something as, as equal to human or not. It, it makes it incredible increasingly difficult to know who or what you're talking to at any given time. So that's something that that really needs to be brought into that paradigm shift. 
Um, and the final thing that I just say uh, briefly, and I, I've written about this before, and it's something I'm, I'm continuing, I have a continuing interest in, is that the corporate um, move into education. Um, and I'm very conscious that when using these devices, whether it's Zoom or Teams or whatever, or things like Second Life or ChatGPT or any of the virtual realities, these are all developed by corporations with corporate um, underpinning structures and so on. Um, and I've set out about five principles that I think we need to start pushing from an academic perspective in, in the education world that platforms like this need to have. And it's things like recognizing academic freedom and so on. Um, and we need to use our power as academic institutions to start making those demands of the companies and the corporations that expect us to use their tools. We need to do that collaboratively and we need to do that as, as a sector because we can't do it individually. But we do need to work with them, that we do need to collaborate. So um, I think there's a lot of work to be done there in beginning to understand each other's positions and how we can help each other. Thank you, John. We don't uh, seem to have questions from the audience. No. So we move to Muraj, and um, we we and stand by then for the panel discussion that will take place at the end because I think we have a, a lot of things to discuss. So Muraj, when you're ready, please. Okay. Thank you, Lucia. Um, I'm going to share my slides as well to begin with. Okay. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here with you and with the esteemed colleagues. And um, I apologize for my voice because uh, I got a flu right now and my voice is cracking a little bit. I hope I can cope with it to the whole panel. And um, my name is Murat Gulmaz, uh, also known as Magua in the virtual world. Uh, I mentioned this because of the uh, content of my presentation is kind of a reflection of my virtual identity as well. And uh, <laughs> Sorry, slides were not moving, so I'm just gonna fix it. You see the slides still? No, we cannot see your slides. You don't see it now? No, we see you. Okay. Just a second. Sorry, I apologize for that. Yeah. Now? Uh, we're waiting. I think it's, yep, we see it now. Okay. So, um, the thing is, the first thing is the transformation. The transformation is happening right now. It is a change that we're going through. And there are two pillars in my mind that drives this transformation. One of them is the digital transformation. The other one is the sustainability, which uh, affecting all of us right now. I mean, sustainability, you can think of like the environmental change uh, and how we are coping with that, as well as how we're going to sustain what we're doing, how we're going to continue what we're doing the way that we are doing, or maybe changing, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's, it's like a survival instinct for us. And these two things is going to, you know, affect us anyway, whatever our profession is, whatever we are doing, whatever we are uh, dealing with, uh, digital transformation and the sustainability is there, and it's going to be affecting us. Uh, if you look at this slide, the, on the left side, you see a you know, work desk that we had, let's say, 20, 30 years before. And in this one, we have all those old tools that we use, the cabled telephone, the uh, note uh, cards, the map. Brad, sorry and... to interrupt, uh, but we cannot see your image properly. You could do the presentation mode. 
like because we see it a bit uh... okay now yeah better thank you okay okay um the uh address book on, and the telephone is there so now if you look at the arrows there like now it change it's everything is in our cell phone or in our laptop or a tablet whatever but with an app application that we use everything is replaced by that kind of application that we use today to do our business or to do our uh, work and that is this change we are going to the tools are shaping us or we are shaping the tools that change us that like like john mentioned in his speech it is it is both ways actually it is it's working both ways and then uh, we're going through that change now it's very very common and very normal for all of us using those apps 20 years ago that not, not that did not exist at all and um on the right side you see the trends in the technology one thing is the mobile now we could do everything through our mobile devices it wasn't available like 15, 20 years ago. It, it started to be available, but then it was not that common. Now everyone has the mobile devices. Everyone has the smartphones. Everyone uses the apps. You do the banking through mobile. You do the you know teaching through mobile sometimes. Even uh, the students sometimes join our Zoom, Zoom sessions or so on through their mobile phones. And um, I, I, had a, I had a PhD student actually I didn't know that, not PhD student, sorry, master student that I write thesis with. Uh, I didn't know that he was a truck driver in Europe, basically. And when he connected, we made a session with him about his thesis. He connected from the truck on the border of Germany. So I said, OK, it, it, it was kind of weird, but then that happens now. OK, and then the next thing is the data. The data is everywhere and data is available for anyone. And the quality of data is a question mark. You have many things measured by now with different technologies, and it's available for us. And we're talking about even Internet of Things, that the things, the objects will create data or collect data and make it available for us. So we are doing it. We are using it already. But then it's going to be even more and more data involved in our life and if we use that wisely if you use that data in a good way then you might be much more effective right that is that is how we, what we're working through and then um the specialization uh we have apps or we have different uh softwares specialized in certain things take for example linkedin a social network but it's specialized in the professional network right so we have tools like that now, specialized for certain areas, certain thing, and we will use those. And among those changing technologies and everything else, I picked one of them to, to be my interest. Uh, it was year 2006, and I found on an uh, article on a newspaper that the, the uh, title was the companies are starting to take their place uh, in virtual worlds. So I took it, read it, and then I Googled it and get into the virtual world. That was my first step in the virtual world. <laughs> Excuse me. And then after that, since then, I've been in the virtual world and I have a virtual life as well there. And it's called the second life, uh, the one here on the right side you see. And um, you see other virtual worlds, like the World of Warcraft, the Entropia universe, and other stuff. Those are like games, and you can call them games. And they have a virtual platform, which is multiplayer, uh, engage in those. And all around the world, people are getting in and playing together, doing things together. And Second Life is something like that, similar, but it's not a game. It's, it doesn't have an aim to you know level up or kill each other or kill the monster. It doesn't have that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's more like a replica of a life, 
what is what is your life and what is your goal in the life you can do a similar goal and achieve it there okay and the after that since 2006 it has been years i have been doing things there and so on and then until uh, last year sometime uh meta worst term was started to use commonly the reason was the facebook formerly facebook changed its name to meta and they mentioned it and it was suddenly all on the tv everywhere they were talking about metaverse 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 and then we knew that that metaverse was not a new term but it was not popular it was coined in 1992 by snow crash novel uh, by neil stevenson uh, and then the owner of Second Life at that time, Philip Rosedale, took that idea and, you know, he said, I'm going to create that world that is in the book, which is the metaverse. And then he created the Second Life. So Second Life is kind of, you could consider it one of the first metaverse platforms that we have. And what happens in the Second Life or the virtual world? There are companies, they are selling, they are selling virtual goods, they are selling C2C. B2C, B2B businesses, you see that. Building communities, they have customer support, training and research is going on, public relations are going on, marketing is going on, events are going on, nonprofits are there. So there's a whole bunch of things going on. And it was on the Newsweek, it was on the uh, Times or you know uh, other journals in, in, in certain times that they, they were seeing that, okay, there is a virtual market there. And that triggered me. I'm a business professor, uh, marketing professor. And when I see that all those things are in the virtual world, it's a good simulation of what we have been doing, like what we try to teach to the students. There are products there, there are sellers, buyers, the market is there. I can use this platform to teach marketing or business to the students. That is a perfect you know, platform and it's ready. I don't need to build it. That, that, that was the first idea that I had in mind when I see that. And that is my avatar, Magua. And then, yes, I I was born in 2006 as an avatar. And I have been using that same avatar for many years. And um, I do a lot of things there. I have friends there. I'm uh, spending time there, uh, maybe more than I should sometimes. Uh, my family complains sometimes that... but. Still, I do my work there. Now I carry all my courses in this, this platform. So that is something that we do. What, what other things that we do? Teaching, research, supervising thesis. We do meetings. We do participating conferences. We have a conference in the world as well, in the virtual world. Uh, and then we have been collaborating with other partners. One of them is TU Dublin. Uh, John O'Connor, uh, the other keynote speaker in this panel, he is one of the colleagues that I found in virtual world. And we started to teach together a joint course uh, since 19, 2019. And um, also we have virtual world education consortium, a consortium of educators who are trying to use virtual world as their uh, platform. And we get together with them. We do events with them, and they're supporting us. And we are uh, support. We're trying to support them. So we kind of collaborate. And those people are from, coming from all over the world. They're not only coming from one country. Um, why? Why did we choose the second life? Because it was one of the most popular at that time, and it was on the news. That's that 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 catched our eyes at first. And I learned it. And once you learn it, you know you want to continue with that. And then in 2023, the number of users in Second Life is reported as 73 million. And the number of an instant online user is 53,000, which means if I log in Second Life right now, an average of around 50,000 people will be online all over the world. That is creating something for us, an opportunity, a community is there. There is a community dedicating to teaching as well there and free to use for students or professors if you want to and provides less opportunities for education and research while being interesting and creative. This is a picture of the campus that we have in real life, and which is on the top and the, the bottom, the um, Second Life campus, which is almost identical. And if 
the buildings on the behind also there if you go with your avatar it doesn't show on the picture but it is there so it's almost identical and the virtual world course <laughs> when it was first designed the term metaverse was not mentioned often and this whole technology was not considered as part of our future by the majority my main goal was to inform the students that this place whether you call it metaverse or virtual worlds exists some people takes it pretty seriously some organizations are working there and creating value, and it provides unique opportunities for many. The course has been designed particularly for business students because I was a business professor and I was in the Faculty of Economics, so I had only business reach for the business students at that time. And uh, to engage in a virtual world and teach them necessary learning outcomes that will be beneficial for them as future managers. The learning objectives uh, as the course uh, are follows. Define virtual worlds, understand the new technology trends related to virtual worlds, understand business aspect of virtual worlds, carry out a project, work as a virtual team about sustainability, understand how to use virtual worlds for society's well-being. And if you think about the SDGs, how they are getting into play is what we teach there, what we do there, kind of related to the SDGs. And I picked up some of them just for this presentation in my mind i just sit down think like for a couple of minutes and then picked up picked on some of those sdgs that we are relating to our course and we have a climate action awareness thing in our course because we have some guests from usa who is uh, making a presentation to our students and talking about the crashing of the ecosystems life below water she's talking about the climate action she's talking about. And then um, we have gender equality, reduced inequalities. In our projects, we are asking our students to create 3D immersive presentation areas which are accessible to anyone. So they are working on the accessibility. Even there are inequalities or like um, there are some uh, handicapped people, they are helping them to access that region in particular. So we got all these things covered in the course and we are applying things. Some of them we apply. Quality of education, we apply. We try to make it more quality education, more motivating and engaging and you know participation from the a lot of people around the world and creating awareness. We try to create awareness about the climate change. We try to create awareness about the uh, uh, accessibility and everything else that we do. But how, how can we achieve all those things in one course is the partnership. Because I'm not an expert on life below water. I learned a lot because of this course myself, but I'm not lecturing that. Someone expert in USA lecturing that and coming to my course without any logistic costs and with a 3D immersive build. So that is what is happening there. That is how we could relate ourselves to the SDGs as well, which we should. Like, that is what I consider as an educator. Like, okay, whenever I teach something, I have to make that connection with the SDGs and tell the students that they have to think the social responsibility side of what they're doing. We're not alone in this world. So we do three courses in one academic year. The Virtual World ISB course, in collaboration with the TU Dublin, offered both and both fall and spring terms. Marketing and sustainability course also held in virtual world and spring terms and the meta entrepreneurship, which is a new course. And we are going to have a session about this one. And one of my colleagues who is in charge of this course is going to talk about more in detail uh, about this tomorrow in one of those uh, events and panels uh, in this event. And it's on it's uh, on fall. So more than an average of 50 students each term are introduced to Second Life. Without I'm not, I don't count the Irish part. John is doing that part. And then we all have avatars now. They all know the necessary digital skills to be a citizen in virtual worlds. And what does that mean for them? How could that contribute their future? Think about that. Like. Is it something valuable? How did we do these 
courses so far, student-led international projects with char charity organizations. Turkish students helped a German organization that helps Kenyan kids in Kenya via virtual learns, for example, one of the projects. Students prepared immersive 3D presentations about sustainability to reach virtual audience. Students participated in International Student Challenge, which was the new thing this year we did. Those are some of the pictures. Mm. It's about, for example, saving the bees. They're talking about the environmental and sustainability topics inside the course. They prepare these immersive areas. We invite people from the audience the uh, in, in virtual world, and then they are introduced uh, to the topic by the students. And they create their own areas, sitting areas. This is our class picture from the spring 2022. John, myself, and our uh, people that help us from the USA, and as well as our students. And that is the last student challenge that we had. Uh, our students actually won the first place, which are which we are um, proud of. And um, they created a platform, and they presented to the jury judge, and they chose as the best presentation. Uh, award and as well as the first place uh, in this contest and this is the pictures from the canyon organization and our students collaboration uh, our students made a concert in virtual world and we sent the money we we collected uh, donations from the virtual world people from all over the world we send that money to the organization and they send, send it to the kids in kenya and they bought candies for them. They bought hot meals for them. And they, we bought um, hundreds of English books for their library, uh, which in three hours event, we, we raised 900 euros, which are enough to buy all of those uh, if you calculate the currency rate and everything else. So those are some of the students' feedbacks from the courses. Uh, I will read one, two of them, and then uh, I will finish my presentation. I met this universe through this course. I love the universe and got used it quickly. It was very productive and enjoyable. I met this world for the first time with this course. I liked it very much. I spent a lot of time outside of the course as well. And our presentation and preparations with the Irish team improved me in the field of teamwork. It was nice to make foreign friends. So, And that was our picture from the graduation during the pandemic, we couldn't have the real graduation. So we created a virtual graduation for our students who took that course and they were able to throw the caps as well. So, virtual words provide a unique teaching experience for us. We made team teaching. Virtual words provides opportunity for international collaborative cooperative work. And the student feedback is generally positive so far. We have been doing this for some years. And there's a steep learning curve at the beginning of the course, but could be frustrating for some students. That is one of the feedback. And it provides a good opportunity for students to learn or Im improve their English as well. This is one of the things that our students dealing with. It's their second language. And it's a, it, creates, it creates a great opportunity for them. And with COVID-19, we were able to switch from blended to totally online mode in no time. We were ready because we had this campus ready before the pandemic. And with more educators involved in virtual worlds, metaverse, with even better technology, it will be one of the technologies that we will have to use in education in the future. Just, I would like to remind you that there is one, $120 billion of investment on metaverse last year alone. And 10 billion of that is a loan from the meta company, Facebook. So now I'm waiting the fruits of those investments. Like what, what did they invest to and what, what we will see in the couple of future years. And that is exciting for me in a way because I'm a technology enthusiast, I would say. And at the same time, I really like to do that in this way, in, in a different way and more motivating way for me as well. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Murat. So yes, a question. Are you okay to take a couple of questions? You want to take a break, maybe water? Yes. 
Yes, we take a break or we take the questions. <laughs> um, I can take the questions uh, if you want. Yeah. Okay, so we go with uh, Sidearm Madonna is asking, how have your students um, continued sustainable development goals activity after they graduated? So that's in the chat. How have your students continued? <laughs> um, the, after they graduate, some of our uh, courses, like the students still stay with us. Like some of them, they come to us and they become assistants for the next term and helping the other students uh, coming alone. And uh, they, they they share a lot of knowledge with the uh, incoming students. And um, since most of our projects are um, depending on the, um, or the team is about the sustainability, so they kind of give tips to them, like what they did and didn't work and what they did and did work. They kind of share that information. That is one way of doing that, I, I would believe. So it is kind of uh, creating awareness and creating uh, sharing the knowledge that they have uh, gathered. And the other way is probably um, some of them are even want to change their career path and do something in virtual world instead of the real real world i don't know um we try to help them as much as we could but then i don't know how realistic it is for now for them uh, to get their earnings through this platform uh, but then it is something uh, that they could maybe achieve and do they are at the end of the day they they are uh, meeting this technology much younger than we are it's their age their time Thank you. Can you hear me? Like I'm having a bit yes. of a problem with, with the microphone. Yes. So I go for, um, you have a second question as well in the chat asking about the impact of virtual life in your real life as an educator and, ox, and also about expectations from your real world have changed. Okay. Um, the virtual life affects your real life. I think it does in a way. I mean, the thing is, like when you when you spend a lot of time there, which I have to because we have a lot of preparations, we have a lot of meetings even before the courses and so on, and uh, it, it it affects definitely my real life. Uh, it is not as easy as teaching the regular course I was teaching for marketing like last ten years. You know, I could do it in a heartbeat the other course, but in this one I have to prepare much more. So it it takes energy and effort for sure and dedication and the other thing is um yeah it might be for example um expectation from the real world change expectation from the real world is kind of guided through the technology i i am looking for the new technologies all the time from the real world to become available so that i could use it in the virtual world so that, that is my uh, mostly uh, what is expected from the real life for me right now so now a question from me. Um, you, you mentioned at the beginning in, in, in your presentation, the issue of sustainability and then the motivation in terms of what you're doing. And you made a connection towards your background in marketing. We have there again, the business element that I, I raise a bit with, with the question towards John. And my point here is uh, we know that uh, humans are the ones that are making the significant change and impact in terms of the environment. And we know again that we have that influence in terms of how the educational system is being managed. So within that context, uh, we, we really have a, a critical kind of challenge as an educators that we need to address because in order to drive change, it can, if we look at technology, if we look at growth, if we look at activities, at the end of the day, it's going to be uh, people the ones that are going to make decisions. And you identify in your environment that it, it behaves like a market. So that enforces again the, the vision that all what we're doing is, is market driven, it is growth driven. And, and that's where we start to see it, this to fall apart because in order to change the dynamic, we have to change how businesses work. And in order to change how businesses work, how are we going to address the sustainability challenge? So from that point of view, how do you think what you're doing in, in Second Life, in, in your teaching, is doing that? Like, what is your contribution? Okay. Um, the, the thing is, like, 
Second Life is built on a virtual economy there. I mean, there's there's an economy there. There's a market there as well, as well as it is existing in the real world. I mean, people are making money there. And the company is definitely making money since they have been around for uh, since 2003 or so. And then um, there is a lot of money involved in this as well. And this is an alternative dimension of an economy uh, for the students. Like they could act here, they could participate here and be part of this economical system as well. That is one thing. The other thing is I have to market what I'm doing in virtual world in order to continue. I have to show my university that I'm doing something valuable and I have to show it to the other companies around uh, like now I'm, I'm I'm discussing with a company nearby that we could offer them a module, a training for their workers in virtual world, for example. And then, so I, I make that connection. Since this is, this is technology and this is definitely our future, we accept it or, you know, deny it. It's, it's going to be there and it is going to be part of the economy. And now we're teaching that. We are trying to teach that how to use this effectively, how to adapt to the change that is happening for the students and how to use it responsibly as well. I mean, if we don't, uh, if, if we don't throw back the sustainability or the responsibility idea so far away and we just combine it to whatever we do, at the end of the day, it is the sustainable economic model. It's helping it anyway. I, I, I fully agree with Ash. We, we'll okay. go back to SDG number eight. And that brings us to Johan. Thanks, Murash. So, Johan, you, uh, your floor is yours. So, we have uh, the discussion now in terms of, of the perspective of education through the eyes of Johan. Um, thank you so much, Lucia. And um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm sure you will agree with me, and I ask you to, to please join me to congratulate both John and Murat for truly brilliant presentations. And even in my wildest dream, I would not be able to um, provide the same type of depth of insight and some of the provocative um, elements that they mentioned. Um, I also would like to just very briefly recognize the contribution of Lucia, John, Murat, Leah, Abrar, and Odette, who was present online um, for your really valuable contributions during the recent uh, climate security conference in the UN Bonn campus. Thank you so much on behalf of UNITAR and TU Dublin. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I am not going to show you a PowerPoint presentation because I'm sure you don't want to hear more. I, As I said, I could not compliment in any way, shape or form um, the brilliance um, that has been uh, highlighted by both John and Murad. But allow me rather, I would like to step back a little bit and talk about the role of the university. Um, within um, society and, and because a number of the elements that you raise talk about this so-called third mission and the changing place of universities, specifically technological universities in society. Because these new demands from society that imply that universities are expected to become more strategic, to be proactive and more explicit in the development, the operationalization, the implementation and the presentation of their relationship within society. In other words, that articulation of the so-called third mission. Now, this third mission has emerged over the last decade as equally important part of universities, we can call it the social contract. So many of us, when we start teaching in the beginning of semester, we create a learning contract with our students or our learners. And this is something similar where we need to create, or it's called a social 
contract or a pact with society um, as they are primary two missions. One is education and the other one is research. But it also requires from universities that they take the responsibility for linking these primary activities of education and research by making it more mutually beneficial in terms of partnerships to the social and the cultural needs of society. And this is often based on the demands from political parties, governments, and as we heard from businesses, so the economy. And we have different sectors of society. And um, so there are not one um, unilateral um, defined uh, definition of society that applies. So to be successful, um, there needs to be a, a full embracement of the so-called knowledge-based economy that includes um, the use of technology. And both my colleagues before showed the reality, the positive and the negative of using artificial intelligence combined with the withdrawal in very many contexts of governments from providing certain public services during the recent a uh, global health pandemic, we saw the difficulties government had to roll out and to provide continued effective medical services. The massification and the entry of private businesses in higher education, specifically in our domain of science, technology, engineering and mathematics have resulted in this growing interest around the world in universities' relationships with society. So this has led to um, many efforts where um, universities renew their um, knowledge creation and transfer strategies, um, how they articulate and um, we've seen some examples, as Murat had uh, mentioned and demonstrated, how the sustainable development um, element was integrated as part of a partnership that looks at social responsibility. At the same time, we see um, COP28 is a perfect example. Um, talking about responsibility is not enough anymore. We have to do a shift in gear. We have to go from action to delivery. So universities are really going through an important transitional period. While this notion of the um, ivory tower um, is, is simply not um, part of the discussion anymore, there is still parts of society that still looks at university um, as being fairly detached because it's not just, um, or there is no access for individuals. Murat mentioned um, his student that was a truck driver um, to, for anybody to be able to, to, to it's part of this um, continued learning that they would be able to join and this notion of lifelong learning. So the way forward is to rebalance the university's three missions and build on the achievements realized until now. And this calls for a more proactive university leadership that looks beyond the lens of only research output and accreditation rankings more managerial and academic capacity for the university committed to the university's achievement of the third mission in terms of strategies and activities that are embedded in partnership with society and more effective university personnel policies that are truly contributing to creating innovative new study programs 
and educational tracks. Both John and Murat mentioned um, a number of key skills and competencies that needs to be delivered, individuals that need to um, be prepared in order to operate successfully in this VUCA world, this complex and uncertain world in which we find ourselves. So development in this direction also requires the commitment and the support of national, regional, and local authorities, as well as external stakeholders to the university. And the United Nations Institute for Training and Research is such a partner and a stakeholder because our value proposition in support of delivering a distinctive learner-centered multidisciplinary approach in which the workplace, in which the learner finds itself is used as the applied learning environment using both pedagogy, andragogy, and constructivism. In other words, UNITAR offers partnerships that continue to evolve within the framework of changing societal needs of our target populations in societies, as well as the changing structural demand for these related skills, attitudes, and behaviors within the context of the evolving technological and social economic landscape. And if you bear with me, there is just one slide that I would like to share with you. And this um, summarizes some of these disruptive shifts and the skills um, that we need. And I am just going to share my screen. Recording in progress. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, because, yeah. um, so this is a study that was done by the Institute for the Future, which is the University of uh, Phoenix, and they were looking to identify what are those disruptive shifts, and they came up with extreme longevity, the computational world, superstructured organizations, the globally connected world, the new media ecology, and the rise and use of smart machines and systems. Now, for us as educational institutions, how do we articulate um, the development of very specific skill sets? And this research identified 10 skill sets, and I very quickly walk you through it. So sense making is the ability to determine the deeper meaning or significant of what is being expressed. Social intelligence, the ability to connect to others in a deep and different way to sense and to stimulate reactions and desired interactions. Novel and adaptive thinking. It focuses on developing the proficiency at thinking and coming up with solutions and responses beyond that which is rote and rule-based. Number four, the cross-cultural competency, the ability to operate in different cultural settings. And, and here very often, ladies and gentlemen, when we use the, um, we all assess our students based on their capacity and their command of critical thinking. But so many of our students don't come from the um, European or the Socratic principle of using critical thinking. There is um, different, um, cultural value propositions in which students can add value coming from a non-traditional Socratic reasoning principle. But we use that in a bias because we say, can you not come immediately to the point rather than trying to look at all the complexity? So just one example, the computational thinking 
is the ability to translate vast amount of data into abstract concepts and to understand data-based reasoning. Number six, new media literature, the ability to critically assess and develop content that uses new media forms and to leverage these forms for persuasive communication and impact. Seven, transdisciplinarity. This one here is about the literacy in and the ability to understand concepts across multiple disciplines from a transdisciplinary and across disciplinary perspective. Number eight, the design mindset, the ability to represent and develop tasks and work processes for the desired outcomes. Uh, the last two, the cognitive workload is the ability to discriminate and filter information based on importance and to understand how to maximize cognitive functioning using a variety of tools and techniques. And both the previous speaker um, showed just how artificial intelligence from a human-centered perspective has immense potential. And then virtual collaboration. I, I think Murat's presentation of his um, virtual personality and course um, was a perfect illustration to that. So. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to stop sharing. And just again, is I, I think what I try to highlight is let's also um, don't focus only on, on technology, but let's also look at that very important role that um, we as educators, but as institutions can play in accelerating that social contract and partnership that we have in society, because that win-win situation is just going to also um, help us to create that value proposition and outcome um, to develop um, skill sets that are going to be so relevant um, and, and, and let's embrace artificial intelligence as a unique opportunity, but let's make sure that we use it from a human-centered um, perspective. Thank you very much. And back to you, Lucia. Thank you very much. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a bit controversial here in terms of uh, what is being discussed and, and I'm going to link to COP28 outcome. Uh, we're they're very happy. I think I heard that in the news. That, yeah, an agreement has been reached, and we're going to accelerate now towards the transition. Let's say to sustainability, green economics, and so on. But the reality there is that eighty percent of the global economy is 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 like fuel by fossil fuels, by by those that pollute. And the transition is going to come to make that economic massive economic change. And then universities face a challenge in terms of how they make money through attracting the students because education is not free. And we're talking about different type of people Johannes you has mentioned, like how, how we reach to those that, and we saw some pictures from RAS that don't even have food. And we're talking about kids that just, depending on where you have uh, born, you are already uh, settled for success or failure. Um, so how can education, at higher level contribute to this change when uh, whether we like it or not, I think we follow as a, a, a teacher centered approach. Like the teacher is still dominates. In many cases, we are using technology just to through like information to the students, but we have a huge difficulty to say how we develop critical thinking, how we develop all these type of additional skills that require more interaction. And that goes back to what John was saying, uh, the role of the educator, not the role of the teacher. The, the confusion then between the teacher center, student center and what we're doing. So what is that shift them in education when what we see is again, an economic driven type of model? John Hans. Allow me first to comment on the outcome of COP28. Um, we can look at the glass half empty or we can look at the glass half full. My personal view is I prefer to look at the glass half full because this was the first time that um, 
natural um, gas and oil companies were mentioned is to reduce. So that has been quite a shift because the first time it's articulated now. How how do we, as as let me just there's also a contradiction where one of the world's biggest exporters was um, trying to frame it as a as a massive um, outcome. So, and and I think this is where we have such a fundamental responsibility in the way that we um, train and develop individuals to be able to have this ability to look at both sides of a highly complex world. But very often when we use our assessments, it's very much based on um, theories and knowledge constructs and paradigms, which simply are not relevant anymore in this world. And let's take it one step further. When we look at so many of the business theories, constructs, paradigms, it comes from a certain region in the world. So again, that way in which a, a clear bias is embedded in a discipline, and that is what continues to dominate so much of the so-called um, you know, MBA type studies. And then add another element to it is the um, international accreditation standards, which again sits in, in um, and continues to be inspired by so many of these outdated and irrelevant business principles. And, and if we're going to continue to embrace those and we're not going to um, take the lead in being coaches, facilitators and allowing our learners um, and, and this is the element of the social constructions and that is so important is what we deliver and how the students are then and the learners are able to use it within their so political socio-economic context is worth gold and 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 we have a fundamental responsibility um to ensure that is exactly the value proposition and the outcome um that individuals um have when they go through the 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 learning experience that we offer otherwise we are just going to see a repeat of um assimilation and the end of the world the negative predatory business principles that are then imposed on these societies will just continue so i would like to give the word uh to john and murat like in terms it, it was my my controversial comment was for the three of you <laughs> <laughs> um i think um <clears throat> We have allowed in the world, we've allowed kind of business and technology to lead us. Um, we haven't really found a way to operate on a global scale as a community um, that has any level of maturity yet. And, and all the wars, uh, the battling for resources um, and just the whole general approach and the, the level of difficulty that we witnessed at COP just to get a very meager um, output, significant uh, but meager. And, and like John Hams, though I, uh, John Hams, I am glass half full person. So I was listening to Mary Robinson uh, on the news this morning, talk, giving her view on it, and um, <clears throat> you know she deliberately uh, raised those issues in a very difficult environment, and I think she got a result that she wanted. But but. In order to arrive at that kind of community, we've got to frame our education within a social, um, and I hesitate to use the word ethical, but but let me leave it at social for the moment, within a social context. So in other words, we need to shift that perception from the individual to the community and what our responsibilities as citizens of the planet are, as opposed to citizens of a particular country or nation or block. Um, and that's a process that, that, that we as educators have uh, have an opportunity and we have we have great power in because it's, you know, we're, we're dealing with people who are at a very formative stage of their lives. And that's our responsibility is to, in my view, is not to give them ideology or not to give them answers, but to help them 
to question what they're seeing around them. And I think John Hamm's made another really important point about the perspectives. You know, we, we, we talked about the critical thinking approach in the Socratic method. Yeah, that's great. And it's and that's one method, but we need to be open to all the others. We and we and of course the only way to do that is to firstly recognize that we are all coming from a bias. We all have our own biases and our own issues. And we none of us can be truly objective. So the only option for us is to be open and to listen to as many different perspectives as we can and to discriminate. Um, and I think, as Murat said, in one of the really great things about the metaverse space is that it allows that connection to form without people having to travel. It's much easier, as Murat said, and he referenced all the different people that teach on our courses. Um, and we, we do this on a daily basis. Um, so I think there's there's huge potential in that. Murat? Yeah, I, I agree with John and um, John Hans as well um, about the, looking at the, you know, uh, half glass full approach because, I mean, what, what, what is the positive thing about looking at the other way around? So it's like, um, that is the only solution, I, I would say. And then the only problem is that, do we have time for that? Like, I mean, we, we it, it's happening so fast, it, it seems. And uh, the it, it has a we have a big pressure of time right now on us and that could be a good thing i mean a, 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 as, a, as a Turk, like we, we do it uh, most of the things in the last minute so it's like uh, we are used to that because we are living in a very different geographical location everything changes uh, in a daily basis here and so on so we are used to that but uh, do we all used to you know ready for that like to do that change in a very fast um way um because the only solution seems to be the education and education takes time that is the that is the problem that i couldn't solve in my mind how could we solve that and the only solution that comes to my mind is the partnership because when we do that partnership and when we collaborate when we bring our forces together things happen much more effective and a you know better way uh, in, in in a short time like without using a lot of resources without losing using a lot of efforts because like somebody is already built that uh for example the climate change area in virtual world so i don't need to build it and give it to my students it's already there i just bring that person in my class and she shares that information or whatever the build is so we could do the, these things. We could share the resources. We could share the effort. And that could probably be a catalyzer in that process. So we have a question uh, online. Like I'm trying to move this up, but it's not working. So can you hear me? <laughs> now I lost connection. So there is a question yes. from Sidearm. Like if somebody can, uh, John, uh, maybe you can read it for Murash and John Hans to, to address it because my screen is just yep. froze. <laughs> so Sidearm's question is, where are you seeing business universities starting to take a lead in tangibly shifting to the new social construction mindset? John Hans, maybe to start. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Look at the faces, look at the institutions that are um, present. You are the change makers. You are the fact that so many of you joined us when we had that uh, inaugural conference um, in Bonn. Um, the rich contributions that you made. So again, I, I, I would like to congratulate and say you are driving this forward. You have an important value proposition that you are starting to deliver. And uh, as we say, change starts at home. So um, make sure that you, in terms of um, acceleration, value proposition, just continue um, in, in, in this road forward. But also um, in terms of the peer process how many of the learners that are and and i'm uh, going to use the example of abrar um she's a phd candidate and uh how much of what she was contributing to the um climate conference in her panel discussions was truly remarkable and i think this is also where it's important that we 
validate the individual learner that we have in the classroom and that it's not just the teacher, the educator that has, it's the only holder of the truth because it's based on some, um, as I said, and I'm deliberately being controversial, some outdated theory or, or a theory that's simply not relevant. Celebrate your community of knowledge and the expertise that students as peers bring into the classroom. And that joint responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, will take us in our common humanity several steps forward. Thank you. Thank you, Johans. Um, I move to Murat, maybe final words, and then I conclude. We are 10 minutes <laughs> over time, and okay. colleagues probably waiting to go for the lunch as well. Um, so Murat, and then uh, I- Okay. Um, the first thing that I would like to say here is like, um, when we introduced that marketing and sustainability course, it was the fourth year of the college business school. And one of my students raised his hands and asked me that, okay, Professor, you have been telling us how to make money, you know, how to make profit for the last three years. Now you're talking about that we have to be socially conscious and, you know, forget about the profit. Uh, isn't that a contradiction? So that was kind of the ringing the bell for us. Like, okay, we should have included this thinking, this mindset from the first year when they, you know, took their first step to the business school. And maybe it's the side terms question, like the, what are the roles of the business school? Or the business universities here like we yes we we have to include in our curriculum all these thinkings all these you know talking about how we should do it in a responsible way i mean yes we should still produce we should still contribute to the economy but at the same time we should be you know cautious and think about what are we doing to the society while we are doing that and that is something that uh, we are and we should be working on it. And according to the research that you have made in uh, in TU Dublin, even with among the uh, PhD students in a developed country, even the SDGs are not so well known. You could see that. So it is. We we are we are, we are at, still at the beginning of that. We should start with awareing, creating awareness at first, and that is then those PhDs will talk about the SDGs to the next generation and so on. But the problem is the time is limited. So solve the problem. I don't know, Sidar. <laughs> so so I, 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 I move to the conclusion. Um, I like to probably highlight the word transdisciplinarity. Johans, you mentioned that in, in, in your uh, presentation in the PowerPoint. And that's something that it, it has been discussed significantly within Ilara and Leah that is there has been like, it's transdisciplinarity, everyone. And we are like, well, you know, <laughs> how we do that? And then you have Lucia in those teams like, guys, it's about economics, you know, like it's about money. This is how the world is moving. And then we have the educational framework. Our group, it's having those discussions and we're trying hard to try to see, okay, how, how do we understand each other? And in the conference in Bonn, uh, in the framework of United Nations, it was very clear and it was told by everybody, we work in silos. And then it was a professor from, uh, I think Johans, it was Professor Donahue who mentioned that we work now in cylinders. <laughs> that okay, <laughs> so silos, cylinders, uh, whatever it is, and we're not talking to each other. And we are educators, we're academics, we're researchers, and then we fight in terms of status, promotions, different roles, and we lose perspective regarding what we're supposed to be doing. That is, be in the classroom, make those connections, talk to our colleagues, and see how we can improve education and see what is our impact, what actions we're making. And uh, again, I'm back to transdisciplinarity. How we do that is we don't talk to each other and see the different perspective and what each one of us bring to the table. And um, that's what allow us to move forward. And um, I think I probably leave it there because uh, that's the challenge. We economists, we work in silos and we have our own perspective and we will come tell you, you forgot the money <laughs> and you will see that discussion all around and somebody like, no, you're not talking my talk, so you're not my friend. Well, no, it's, it's open. You can agree, you can disagree, you can open the dialogue 
And I think that's, that's what we're trying to do. And I think that's where education should be moving uh, forward. So thank you so much to John, to John Hans, to Murash, uh, for, for responding to the call and participating in this event. I think we have started an, a nice debate and I think it's, it's about high quality education. And, and now it's like, how we do it?